before we get started, let me just stress how important it is that you watch or listen to the entire show because we're going to delve into multiple topics of conversation, conversation that is pertinent to us. We need to, we must have color vision. If you listen to the entire show, you'll be less likely to take something out of context or be tempted to cherry pick a word or a phrase to disagree with me on. Fact checkers will check and haters will hate. Just to be clear, when we talk about the issues affecting African-Americans and people of color, we're not doing it to exclude others. We're doing it to focus on our issues. African-Americans and people of color are the ones who way too often are adversely affected by certain issues. This should go without saying, but I put it out there anyway. I want to remind everyone to please share the YouTube link to this show with everyone you know and those you don't know. If you like what you see and hear, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, please follow and like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. I like to start each show by trying, and I stress the word trying, to take the pulse of our nation. If you watch or listen to this show on a regular basis, you know that America doesn't really act like, behave like it's one distinct individual nation, the mythical melting pot, but America acts more like it contains multiple nations within a nation based upon race, ethnicity, religion, etc. So from time to time, I ask myself, are we as a people progressing? Are we somewhat stagnant? Are we regressing? What is our vision? We need color vision. Have you ever noticed that whenever you run across a man who self identifies as white and he appears, at least on the surface, to be a staunch supporter of the so-called black or African-American movement. Usually he's not just a lover of the brethren or someone who really and truly believes in so-called equality between the races. Actually, he's quite often just very legal minded. A person of principle when it comes to rules regulations and the letter of the law. Kind of like in that movie, A Time to Kill, starring Samuel L. Jackson, where Samuel L. Jackson's character kills two white men who viciously beat and raped his daughter. And a white lawyer, played by Matthew McConaughey, agrees to defend this act of revenge by a black man against two white men in racially charged Mississippi in the 1980s. There are men who self-identify as white who really are just people of principle. They understand the law and they want it applied evenly. And we have to be able to appreciate people like that. They may not really and truly see us as brethren, but at least many of them are able to, in some regards, respect or to quote unquote tolerate us. They are quite often simply just fair minded individuals willing to buck the system of racism, buck the system of prejudice that sees things based on popular belief or tribalism. The moral to the story is the outlawing of the import of Africans via the Atlantic Ocean to be used as slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation, 
the 14th Amendment. The case of Brown versus the Board of Education. The Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Hate crime legislation. These things were all great achievements necessary for freedom and for democracy. And those men and women who self-identify as white, who were on the right side of these monumental accomplishments, should be applauded. However, these were only legal moves. It forces those bigots, racists, and those who hold biases to think twice before openly discriminating against people of color. It created a certain amount of tolerance. The problem is that many people of color over time have begun to mistake this simple tolerance for bona fide goodwill and for true equality and even for brotherhood as bona fide fellow citizens of the United States. The election of the 45th president of the United States was simply a harsh reminder of the fact that maybe we're not really a nation of goodwill or brotherhood toward each other, that we from time to time pretend to be. Maybe we're really just a nation of limited tolerance for each other. It's painful to talk or think that way, but it begs the question. If we can do better as a nation, then why don't we? Let's take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Color Vision. Next, let's talk about economics. Let's follow the money. Show me the money. I was just thinking about the proposed changes to the current tax laws that many are arguing will primarily benefit the wealthy and those making above a certain income. Is it just me or have you also noticed that all too often, not all, but lots of wealthy people, the one percenters? Now, don't get it twisted. There are a few brothers and sisters in that 1%. But all things being equal, most of the one percenters, the vast majority, are those who self-identify as white. Not all, but most. Also, I don't want to leave out the fact that far, far too many politicians, so-called conservatives. Anyway, too many of these people appear to only do the right thing when it's economically or politically expedient. A recent reminder of this was the aftermath of the hurricane that devastated the island of Puerto Rico. When it comes to assisting large populations of those who self-identify as white, it can be argued that the powers that be are more likely to go all in, throw the full force and resources at the nation's disposal, at the crisis. Write the check now and worry about how much is in the bank account later. They appear, and I stress, appear to act very quickly. But, but, when it comes to people of color, the racial dog whistles of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and how people are somehow to blame for living in poverty, for being less fortunate or needy. These dog whistles are sounded. There's quite often a narrative which says that because of their poverty, they deserve to wallow in their misery a little longer, that maybe helping them during this immediate crisis is a waste of resources, that maybe the powers that be need to now step back and look at the systemic poverty or lack of educational infrastructure and mismanagement by local or regional authorities. The old 
teach a man to fish adage comes into play. And because it is usually directed at people of color, I'm more and more convinced that it's a new dog whistle. On the surface, they're pretending to be good stewards. As if they really have the long term best interest of people of color or those who are marginalized. When the truth is that way too often, this is just a way to take jabs at people of color. At those who are disenfranchised. Hey, it seems as though the only time they want to step back and study something in detail is when black and brown people are asking for resources. Hey, listen, I'm not somebody here who's just hating on or bashing wealthy individuals. I mean, I am blessed and highly favored, especially in comparison to so many people of color who are struggling in other parts of the world. I am highly, highly successful and all of my or most of my financial needs are met on a consistent basis. And I thank God for that. Usually these days, when most people use the term wealthy, we're talking about the one or two percent of the wealthiest. Anyway, remember that money by itself is not a problem. It's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. It's attitudes about money and what people do or in some cases don't do with it that causes the problems. And what I'm really talking about here is those who are in the positions to control our economy, positions that control political discourse, positions that control so many of the narratives that affect poor people, less fortunate or needy people and people of color. Hey, even the Bible reminds us to not forget to help others and to share our possessions with them. The moral to the story is the idea that black and brown lives matter is not limited to police brutality and the broken criminal justice system. It extends to the idea that people of color, groups of people of color, are more than worthy of the same equal rights, privileges, the same resources that those who self identify as white are readily afforded access to during a crisis. Since the Emancipation Proclamation, we've complained that while we may be extended rights and privileges on paper, yes, you put it down on paper, but there are times where those privileges are not expressed in everyday reality. This is about basic human decency. And to top it off, when you talk about Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, or any U.S. state or territory. These are United States citizens. From Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, when will America finally stop with the race or skin color or ethnic disparities? And when will those who self-identify as white, those who know within their heart of hearts that this is flat out wrong, When will they start calling out others who self-identify as white? When? Mama, guess what that crazy man just said? It's time for a little political discourse. And that crazy man that I'm playfully, lightheartedly, while rolling my eyes, referring to is POTUS. Number 45. The other day I had this eureka moment. What was everyone thinking when they freed millions of slaves and then left them in the same general population with their former slave masters? Think about it. We should have been given our own state or maybe a couple of states to get ourselves together, to get used to, to learn how to once again live as free men and women like our ancestors, who we were often snatched from in Africa, at least for a few generations before reintegrating with whites after slavery. You know what? 
I find myself more and more these days calling out men who self-identify as white on talk radio. Today I was listening to Morning Joe on Sirius XM radio, and it wasn't that he was wrong about what he was saying. It's just that something just rose up in me, and I just thought to myself, I wish this man who self-identifies as white would just shut up. All the we woulda, coulda, shoulda about number 45 and all the Hillary this and Bernie that talk. All of the political pundit rhetoric. Sometimes it just becomes overwhelming. It's bad enough that we have a commander in chief who doesn't have a clue about civility or decorum, mainly because his whole life he's always gotten the proverbial richest guy in the room exemption. Yes, I get it. Many who self-identify as white are also surprised by number 45's election. Many of them also feel hurt by number 45's election. Yes, many of them are adversely affected by his election, but at the end of the day, their white privilege shields them from some of the harsher effects or results that people of color feel. They will always be granted a certain amount of mercy, leniency, a certain amount of, if you will, grace, a certain amount of residual brotherhood based on their so-called whiteness. If they make a mistake, there is far more likely to be an automatic presumption of innocence until proven guilty. They will always want to find out their backstory. As if one of them making a stupid mistake or breaking the law is so unheard of that they just have to get to the bottom of why that one wasn't perfect like the rest. Sheesh, give me a break. In my opinion, no matter how oppressed some of them may feel, they will continue to have a voice. I saw a meme the other day that showed a light brown skinned man holding a rifle and the caption read terrorist. A black or brown man was also holding a rifle and the caption labeled him as a thug. Then there was a white guy holding a rifle whose caption read that he was a complex individual with specific mental health issues who was kind to his neighbors, etc., etc. This is why it sometimes irks me, even when well-meaning, well-intentioned men who self-identify as white, many of whom I should really, really try to see as allies, but it irks me sometimes when they speak. The moral to the story is, yes, of course, persecution often extends to those who self-identify as white. However, typically the persecution is individual based. It's typically personal on a case by case basis and not systemic. Rarely, if ever, is it long term or lifelong. Just saying. We need to do another break. Hold on. We'll be right back. Let's talk about religion. Let's talk faith. The word religion can be a turnoff to some people. So. I like using the word faith or faith based, but the word religion does give people kind of a heads up, if you will, a bit of a warning about what's coming next in the discussion. As always, I start this segment off by asking the question, is that in the Bible? How does the social, economic, political rhetoric that's making rounds around the major news networks How does it line up with what the good book says? And I use the Bible as my reference 
for this segment because A, that's what I'm comfortable with. B, a lot of the political discourse is or claims to be tied to this idea of Judeo-Christian values. And if those two reasons aren't good enough, at the end of the day, this is my show. I'm the captain of this ship. I'm starting to believe that based upon not only the election of number 45, but the continued staunch support by his base, that character is not what counts most in America. What seems to count most is a person's contribution to society as a whole. If their contribution is big enough, valuable enough, it's almost as if you can do no wrong. Because like a big corporation, you become too big to fail. Isn't this how number 45 and those like him are allowed to flourish? And maybe it's why it seems as though our laws are set up to punish petty crimes and minor character flaws more harshly. When you do the math, when you study the statistics on who is really punished or ostracized, who is marginalized for their lack of character, it's typically not the super rich or the powerful. Maybe this is why number 45 said he would ask for forgiveness if, if he ever did anything wrong. Sheesh. I have a sneaky suspicion that he's never read the verse that says God corrects his children. If he doesn't correct you, you're not his child. Am I the only one who's starting to think that the so-called white evangelical movement will stand behind any candidate? As long as the candidate is opposed to anything that benefits African-Americans and people of color or anything that's seen as quote unquote liberal, isn't this the utmost hypocrisy? Because the same systems that benefit African Americans and other people of color, the same systems that benefit working class and poor people, the same systems and benefits also benefit a large majority of those same so-called evangelicals. The moral to the story is, so what they're saying is, if a person's mission is big enough, important enough, then character doesn't matter because the ends justify the means. How can any so-called evangelical preacher or teacher who voted for number 45 or encourage others to vote, how can they ever stand in front of a congregation and ever teach about character or the fruit of the spirit? Fruit which, in my personal opinion, number 45 has never, ever displayed. I only have two things to say. One is, go Cowboys. Two is that, I'm not feeling the NFL right now. I'm doing my best not to watch any NFL games this season. Even my beloved Cowboys, I'm supporting Colin Kaepernick, but I'm also supporting the First Amendment rights of all Americans. Just tired of all the social injustices. I heard Skip Bayless from the Skip and Shannon TV show, Undisputed. I heard him say that he believes that more black men, black NFL players, should kneel. In light of the fairly recent incident where one of the NFL owners compared the NFL to a prison, this owner said that you can't let the prisoners run the prison or something to that effect. Anyway, Skip said that in his opinion, as a man who self-identifies as white, he thinks that more black men should kneel in light of this owner's comments. But you know what? I asked the question, why don't NFL players who self-identify as white, why don't they also kneel? 
why aren't those who self-identify as white offended at the comments that that owner made as well? This, to me, is the million dollar question. Why aren't more people who self-identify as white appalled at the comments of this owner? Appalled at the daily displays of poor white behavior, bigotry and racism around the nation. The moral to the story is the reason why we don't see more NFL players who self-identify as white sympathizing with us on these issues is because so-called white sympathizers are really quite rare. Those who side with us are more often than not painted by their white peers as being so-called liberal, leftist, weak, naive, whereas back during segregation they would have been called communist or even to borrow a phrase from Harper Lee's book, To Kill a Mockingbird, quote unquote, nigger lovers. However, we cannot give those who self-identify as white a free pass. Those who passively sit by and watch others who self-identify as white oppress African Americans and people of color. We can't let them hide behind the misguided American notion that We are a country of quote unquote individuals. The old notion of every man for himself, the notion that it's not their fight. So why bother? That's why when some biased or racist police officer assaults or even kills a black man during a routine traffic stop, white men in general, not all, but in general, They see it as having nothing to do with them or their own quote unquote individuality. The phrase, it's not my concern, is a phrase that should be a cuss word, a four letter word to whites who claim to be people of spiritual faith or for those who tout freedom, liberty and peace as their mantra. Let's take a quick break. Hold on. We'll be right back. Well, I'm ready to drop the mic, but I can't. Not yet. First, let's talk about entertainment. Well, hey, it's that time of year. Holiday season. Tis the season. Colder weather. Celebrating Christmas, which is by far my favorite holiday. Always. Kwanzaa. New Year's Eve. But this year I see something on the calendar called the hip hop nutcracker starring or featuring rap legend Curtis Blow. It's happening in Newark, New Jersey. If you get the opportunity to attend, hit us up and let us know how it went. It's supposed to be an urban dance retelling of the nutcracker fairy tale. Rap legend Curtis Blow is going to be the special guest MC, going to have a dozen all-star dancers, a DJ, definitely going to give the traditional nutcracker story new life with this big time urban twist. As most of you know, I won't or I don't always get into the particulars, the nuances, the specific details of the 24 hour news cycle. I prefer to take a macro view of topics, the big picture view of topics of this thing, this conglomeration we call life. This is why I really appreciate those talk shows, those journalists out there who share our vision, color vision. Those who spend their lives operating in the details, digging out details for us, because those details are very important. I strongly encourage you to seek out those sources of news and information that are not only fact-checked, peer-reviewed, credibly sourced, but those that are able to see the world through our eyes with color vision. 
academic analysis and good research are paramount. But so is understanding what it feels like to be a person of color in America. We can not rely on local or cable news to look out for our best interests. Again, the election of number 45 was a wake up call. Well, hey, I'm out of time for this episode. But if you have a story to share or would like to suggest a topic that you would like for us to talk about, then please reach out to us on social media or visit our site at ourviz.com. Until next time, always remember that vision looks outward and becomes aspiration. Peace. Peace.